Okay, in this video we're working on hypothesis testing again. We're looking at the critical value step of hypothesis testing. By far the most complicated uh, step of hypothesis testing. By far it's the um, one that has the most theory involved in it. So there's a lot to talk about. Let's try to get right into it then. Remember we're testing the claim that the mean time to complete a bachelor's degree is greater than four years. We have the competing pair of hypotheses HO and HA here that we've been working with. That's expressed. We had some data. And from the data we had calculated a test statistic. So let's talk about this critical value idea. What we're trying to do is to determine how we decide between these two hypotheses. I want to keep in mind that we're always testing HO. We're always assuming HO to be true. I want to point out something, though, that the set of values that would make HO true, if the mean were any of these values, HO would be true. right? If the mean was somewhere between 0 and 4 inclusive, we would say that HO is correct. If the value for the population mean was instead from 4 to infinity, right? any number in that set, then HA would be the correct, right? That, the correct hypothesis. So the hardest scenario for us to distinguish between HO and HA, remember this is the H NOS camp and this is the H alternatives camp, right? So we have those two, two groups, right? Two opposing sets. The hardest time to distinguish between this set and this set, or distinguish between whether HO is true or HA is true, is when HO is true because the real population mean is 4. If the real population mean was 4, remember we're looking at numbers in here that we're concerned with because we're always testing HO. So even though it might be equally difficult to figure it out if it was 4.1, for example, we're not testing HA. So what we're doing is focusing on this set here. We assume HO to be true, we test HO. The hardest scenario to determine between HO and HA, the hardest uh, case would be if the real population mean was 4. If the real population mean was 4, then what's going to happen is occasionally we would end up getting x bar values, right? x bar values from the population or from the sample, right? That would end up being sometimes bigger than 4 because we know that there's sampling error involved in x bar. You know, it's a point estimator of the mean, it's not exactly the population mean. It's a good point estimator, it has nice properties. It has the property of having the minimum variance, right? It also is unbiased, so those properties say to us essentially that the values for x bar will be clustered around the real population mean. So we expect this x bar value to be near the population mean, but it could be a little higher. And if it's a little higher, it's actually going to spill over into the HA set, and it might trick us into thinking HA is correct when in fact HO is really still correct. So the hardest scenario is going to be when HO, um, the real mean value is that number. So let's assume that HO is true to run our hypothesis test like we're supposed to do. Let's assume it's true, but let's assume it's true in the worst case scenario that the mean is actually 4. Okay, so let's do that then. Let's say that the mean for X bar is going to be 4. Right? So let's look at that. Let's say on some number line down here that lists X bar, that the mean for that is 4. The next thing I want to talk about is what's the shape of its probability distribution? Do we know that? Do we know the shape of x bar's probability distribution? Well, the answer to that is, is yes, we do. The central limit theorem told us as long as the sample size is large, then we can assume that x bar is normally distributed. So we can assume it has a shape like this. Right? We can make that assumption as long as the sample size is large, right? And we also know that its mean would be the population mean, and its standard deviation would be given by this. Sigma over the square root of n. That's the standard deviation for x bar. We don't have sigma, so we're going to use as a substitute here s over the square root of n, right? So squiggly line equal to sign there to say we're going to use that as an estimate. We don't actually know what the real value is, so we'll just use s over the square root of n is an estimate of it. Okay, that'll be suffice for now. All right, so here's the thing. Our logic is going to be like this. Anytime we get a sample data value, x bar, that's too far to the right for this kind of a problem, we're going to decide that if it gets too far away from this center value of 4, at that point we're going to decide that we should reject the null hypothesis HO. We reject HO if we end up getting an x bar value from our sample that's too far to the right. The question is, though, is uh, what's too far to the right? That's really where the critical value comes in. That's going to be the cutoff score. It's that value that's going to tell us if we go past that point that we're going to have a value that's just too far from 
the hypothesized population mean for us to believe any longer that it's true. Now, okay, that makes sense, I think. I hope it makes sense to you. Let's, let's just make sure it's clear to you why that's true. Um, what kind of evidence would make HA look true? <clears throat> what kind of evidence? Well, this is arguing that the mean is greater than 4. So if I have numbers over here, that's less than 4. That doesn't make HA true, right? It would have to be numbers on the right-hand side. So we're going to get to the point where, gee, if we're too far above 4, eventually we'll start to think that HA is correct and HO is incorrect, right? But we want to be careful because we also want to avoid committing a very important major error, which is rejecting a true null hypothesis. Remember, when you reject a true null hypothesis, you're committing the type 1 error. And we said in an earlier video that the type 1 error is to be avoided. So we want to avoid that error. So let's do this. Let's figure out a way that we can avoid committing that error. The way that's going to work is this way. We're going to set up a conditional probability. We're going to set up a probability that um, x bar is greater than some critical x bar value, right? Given that the population mean is actually 4, so what's this saying? This is a conditional probability. What I'm saying is we're going to find the probability that some x bar value that we collect from a sample problem, right, from sample data, is greater than some critical x bar value that we come up with, some cutoff score that we kind of come up with. We're going to make sure that that probability of our value being past that point on the number line, the probability that our value is greater than this magical critical value we're going to come up with, given that the real mean is in fact 4, we want to find that probability, we want to make it small. We're going to make it, let's say, well, let's give a symbol first to it. Let's say we're going to make that alpha. Alpha. That symbol alpha is going to be called our significance level. That's our significance level. Significance level. The same as we dealt with in confidence interval, the same name, right? It's significance level in a hypothesis test is the same name as that significance level we used in the confidence interval, right? It has the same symbol, that alpha symbol. Again, let's, let's read this statement carefully. What is this statement basically saying? It's basically saying that this is the scenario when we commit the type 1 error, right? Because what is it saying? It's saying, hey, the probability that an export value is greater than our critical export value, when the mean is equal to 4, we're going to set that equal to alpha. Now, in actuality, there's a little technical issue here. It won't actually be equal to alpha. It'll actually be equal to alpha, assuming that the mean is 4 here, right? But of course, if we didn't assume the mean to be 4, under HO, we could have a different probability, right? So assuming that the mean is 4, truly is 4, right? Assuming that that's correct, that the mean really is 4, the probability that we would commit this type 1 error then is going to be alpha. Okay, now let's give a number to this alpha, right? And let's clean this statement up a little bit. We want to make this alpha significance level something small. So pick a small probability and we'll use it. Um, I'm going to pick it for us since we can't interact here. I'm going to pick 2.5%. So let's make that 2.5%. Let's make that probability 2.5%. Okay, now, I'm making that 2.5%. Let's look at this statement. Let's clean this up a little bit. This is kind of vague. It says x bar greater than or equal some critical x bar value. Well, this is pretty clear, but this part here, the critical x bar value, what is that, right? We could give a formula to it if we wanted to. I actually don't want to do that. Instead, what I want to do is I want to make some substitutions here. I want to just substitute some stuff and make an equivalent statement that doesn't involve x bar. Can we do that? I think we can do that. We can say this. We can say, look, let's change this statement a little bit. We're going to say the probability that z, which is going to be our test stat, right? Our test stat is greater than, instead of a critical x value, we're going to say your z alpha value, we're going to give it that name, z alpha. Given that the population mean is equal to 4, is going to be equal to 2.5%. That's a little better statement. What I'm saying is the probability that our test stat is greater than this z critical value, it's a critical z value, given that the population mean is 4, that's going to be 2.5%. So basically what we're saying is here, we want to make the area in this tail 2.5%. And that way, when we go out and collect x-bar values, 
if the mean was actually 4, the population mean was 4, 97.5% of the time, right, from 100, you take 2%, you get 2.5%, you get 97.5%. 97.5% of the time, we would get x-bar values that are below that cutoff score, whatever it may be. Now, of course, we can convert these into z-scores, and if we do that, then we can say that whatever the critical z-value is, 97.5% of the time, right, we'll end up with a z-score that's less than uh, this cutoff z-score, given that the population mean is, in fact, Four, right? Okay, so all we have to do is create a, a chart that has a z-score value on it. So let's swap out this x-bar information. Let's fill it in with the z-score stuff, right? So we'll simply say, look, let's put a z-axis here, center the z at zero. That'd be equivalent to x-bar axis where the center was at four, right? We're not going to work with x-bar anymore, but we're interested in figuring out what's this critical z-value. Critical, oops, critical, it's C R I T I C A L, critical value here. We'll call it Z alpha. That's the critical value we're talking about. Why am I giving it that little subscript notation? Remember from confidence interval, we discussed this. If there's a little alpha there, it means there's an alpha amount of area in the tail here. And we said alpha was 2.5%. So that's where we're getting that notation from. Either way, we're trying to figure out what z-score that is. Can we do that? I think we can. I think we know how to do that already. Because in fact, I know that a whole half of the curve from this line over is 50%. I know that if this is 2.5%, then the area in here must be 0.4750. If 4750 is the value I can look up on my z chart, since I want a critical z value, I can look it up on my z chart and I'll get the number 1.960. And that's my critical value for this problem, assuming that I'm going to let my alpha be 2.5%. Of course, you can also look up 2.5% in one tail on a critical t table, going down to the bottom row where they put those z values on it. 2.5%, one tail, and you would also get the 1.960 value. That's the same thing. Okay, either way, let's go back and recap what we just did. What we did is we set the probability of a type 1 error here to be 2.5%. In general, what we've just done is we said this. The probability of a type 1 error for this test for this test is at most is at most two point five percent. 